Now, you're normally behind the camera, aren't you? I am. I've spent a career staying on that side of the lens. <laughs> well, we brought you out front because you are a TV producer and you've worked on heaps of really cool stuff, haven't you? Mm, yeah, I've made a few um, here and internationally. And uh, the most recognisable stuff in New Zealand would be things like um, Sale of the Century and Wheel of Fortune. Sale of the Century. Did you yeah. have that here as well? You I had did. it in England, obviously. Well, it was originally stolen from the uh, Australians <laughs> who stole it from the Americans. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I thought I thought we invented it. <laughs> no, sorry, but no. Yeah. So, gosh, Sale of the Century, Wheel of Fortune, all of those, I mean, they've been around a while and obviously quite iconic. You yeah, know? there was strip formatted shows were big here for a long time. Yeah. So we made I think something like Sale, we made 1,065 episodes for oh my five and a half year run. Oh uh, so <clears throat> and that gets a bit boring after a while because you tend to you make the same thing yeah. day in and day out. Yeah. And you know you do five shows a day. Five shows a five shows a day. Five episodes a day, completely finished. <laughs> we we do like two. We do two a day, and I think we're really rolling here. Oh, and yeah. we all go home. We're like oh exhausted. You know we've got to drink wine and stuff. I, I consult now, so I could come in and help you out with that. Yeah. Do you know yeah. I don't know if I want to do five a day. <laughs> <laughs> we did better when we made Wheel of Fortune when Philip Leishman was on the show. We used to make 15 shows in two days, so eight on the first and seven on the second. Blimey. And we had to carry them out of the studio. The hosts were completely stuffed. They just I bet. couldn't speak to save their lives. I bet, actually. But uh, it was the only way we could make it work in the budget. Gosh. Yeah. Well, hey, that's, that's food for thought. You've yeah. actually got me thinking now. <laughs> yeah. And listen, you've worked on Idol and things like that as well, haven't you? Yes. Um, Idol was probably the biggest entertainment show that I've been involved in. Mm. I was running Fremantle Media in Asia when I was uh, making Idol. And so we made um, uh, nine shows in eight countries. Wow. Yeah, so I was travelling a lot. And uh, it was the same problems in every, in every different city, but just different languages. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you that, whether it was different in different places. So culturally, it, it's just the same. It's just the idle culture, is it? Yeah, but there are, each, each culture has its own problems. Like in Thailand, you can't have anything to do with the feet. You know, so if, if your feet are pointing <laughs> the wrong way, for instance, you can actually be insulting somebody. <laughs> wow, yeah. got, got me, yeah, <laughs> got me know, thinking about it now. You know, because, you know, your feet are always touching the dirt, and so if people, you're pointing your feet towards someone, they, they feel that you're implying that they're, they're deserving of dirt, you know. Oh, my word. I'm, <clears throat> right, I'm going to uncross my legs now, <laughs> put my right. feet firmly on the ground. How yeah. interesting. What, what other cultural things did you come across? Um, the Philippines, for instance, was uh, singers, just natural singers. Yeah. And a lot of the things we do in Idol with the training and and, uh, and how we'd present things on stage. They'd go, no, no, that's not how we do things here. So mm. they, they would want to, t to ad adapt it to them. And so you just had to be culturally sensitive to um, to each different location. Yeah. And they always made tweaks, and, and London always had a problem with me. They classified <laughs> me as a maverick because they said, look, you, these, this is the format, you can't make these changes. So a maverick, you say? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it was... You had to be to make it work. Yeah. You, I was You've got that look about you, actually. You look like a... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was always out there on my own, and because Asia is you know, 12 hours away from Europe, yeah. you could never call someone and say, is it OK if I do this? You had to make a decision on the day. Yeah. So I'd just do it. Yeah. And 90% of the time it worked. And the, the crazy thing was that you, know, you weren't allowed to change any of the formats, but I'd make changes and then get told off for them. <laughs> and then six months later... <laughs> In Europe, I'd see the same thing I'd done being done there, and that's oh, the only reason they're doing it is because you did it in Asia. There you go. That's my change. Yeah, Come I mean, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got told off for that. <clears throat> what What is the saying? Um, ask permission. Ask, ask forgiveness, not permission. <laughs> yeah, I do that a lot, and I work underground as long as possible. Yeah. yeah. No one really realizes what you're doing. No, that's the, that's the key to um, to keeping things moving along. So yeah. tell me a bit about the things you're working on now. Currently, I've got the, the Winter Games happening in uh, Wanaka. Oh, so yes. that's a pre-Olympic event. Yeah. And it's really a two-week skiing holiday. <laughs> but we, we get up in the you morning. You are a maverick. Come yeah, on. You know, <laughs> we get up in the morning and we, um, we shoot on the mountain for four hours and then ski for the afternoon. Yeah. And then you have to go and have a debrief in a bar somewhere in Queenstown. Sounds shocking. Terrible. Though, it's really hard thing. work. That all sounds great, except I, I don't ski. I'm just awful. So well, yeah, You should come down. And you, it's easy to learn. But it, it's not all beer and skiing, though, is it really? No, it's not. There's, there's some, some serious stuff. That, <laughs> it that is. I've He's done. like, yes, it is. No, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no so it's not really. Okay. There, there is some serious stuff, isn't there? There's, there are some serious moments. And, for instance, uh, we got a call from the government to say we want to do a memorial for Pike River and broadcast it to the nation. Right. And that was on a Thursday. Yeah. And the, the memorial service was the following Wednesday. And so we had to 
pull together all the crew and everything and, and get ourselves in there and, and, and make that. And that was you know, really serious. It was serious. It was really intense. It was taxing and it took a huge toll on the crew. Yeah. You know, we came away from that just in really feeling the pain. Yeah. Um, and so, though, but those are really fulfilling as well because you really feel like you're giving something of your skills you know, and the industry's helping to, you know, get that message out there to, to the nation to say, look, this is bigger than you realise. Yeah. Mm. And what is the hardest thing about TV production, do you think? I've got my own view on that, I can tell yeah. you about it. Yeah, well, you would, but I think that the, the toughest thing is getting the rhythm right. Yeah. And the reason that I could work internationally in cultures where I didn't speak the language was that every show in every format has rhythm. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether it's news or drama or documentary or a game show or an entertainment show. It's not about music, it's about how the pace of the show works. And there's highs and lows in everything. And you know, you look at the news as constructed that they'll start off with warm and fluffy stories and then there'll be highlights and it'll take you up and down. And yeah. you want to be able to make people think and laugh and cry within whatever format you're making. Yeah. You know, that's the ideal. And so identifying the rhythm, once you crack that, you actually can make a show without speaking the language. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I think, I think you're right. I think there's rhythm in how you produce a TV show, how you run your business, mm. how you run your life. You know, it's, yeah. it, it is about identifying really how things are supposed to run. Yeah, and I, I apply that same rule to my the staff and the people I employ. I mean, I employ a lot of uh, contractors. Yeah. And well, I like bringing together teams of people who are all you know, brilliant in their own right and they've got great skill sets, but instead of doing the old thing about leading from the front and do what I say, it's a team thing and I always get everyone to contribute because a cameraman can say, look at something and say, if we just did this or move my camera here or change the lights there, we can improve this like that. You know? yeah. So everybody contributes. And I listen to every idea and, and sometimes you know, there are some things you can't do, but most of the times there are things that you can do. And so crews come into the shows going, hey, we like working with you because we get to participate. We don't just turn up. Yeah. So, you know, that's, and that's just some of the rules I've always applied to, you know, both here and, and uh, locally and internationally. That seems to work. So what would your top tip be for business or life from everything you've learned here, <laughs> abroad, in everything you've ever worked on? Listen to your people and that the best ideas can come from the strangest places. Oh, I like that. The best ideas can come from the strangest places. Gavin, thanks for joining us. It's been fun, thanks.